when I was 15, 15 years old, uh, 75, 1975, during my school days. Well, firstly, I started uh, unarmed combat when I was about nine years old, some eight or nine, at the uh, Fairburn, Fairburn Hall. And it was taught by some old war veterans, naturally getting thrown all about at that age. And uh, it went on for some while, and then it dissipated. And I ended up doing boxing at the Fairburn Hall at the top of the uh, building. They used to have a gym there, a boxing gym. And then that withered away, and by the time I was around about 13, no, sorry, 12 or 13, I started judo. And eventually, the martial arts craze somehow caught on, and uh, I started uh, Kokushinai Karate at around about 13. And I reached, um, I think it was an orange belt after about a year and a half or something like this. And it was a little bit manic because they were really rough and ready. I, I saw a lot of injuries in the coaching, coaching I karate. And then someone told me about a martial arts school, uh, Chinese Kung Fu, uh, Mantis style, and I went up there when I was about 15, something, about 15 and a half, something like this. And uh, I kept it going until Master Yip Ji Gong went back to Hong Kong, around about 78, something like this. And I used to practice with my Kung Fu brothers Nelson Jill, Eric Sang, and in some time around about 1980 I went to Hong Kong and uh, well, stayed at the uh, Grand Master's place. I wrote a letter, in those days you write letters. There was no email. Wrote a letter first and got a reply and then was invited to come over and uh, stay with me. So that's all. There was a lot of people in those days and uh, it was packed the first time and I didn't know what I was getting myself into but uh, I wanted to learn to defend myself and being about 15 you know learn to beat up about 10 people all at once <laughs> yeah so that was my hope obviously that's uh <laughs> Uh, much the same as um, what we're doing today, actually. Uh, it hasn't changed. Um, Taito, Dojong, Sambu Jin. Uh, and there was some sparring. We used to have um, all the headgear in those days. And I think a lot of people wanted to spar. So, uh, but, yeah. Well, from 75 to about 78, I think we went back. It must have been about that, that amount of time. So it's what, three years? And when did you go to Hong Kong? Uh, in 1980. 1980. Um, yes, just after I finished my work and I decided to go to Hong Kong. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to find out what the, how to use the system, how to fight with it, how to, you know. I went back in 1975, um, there was um, Grand Master came over, and uh, Grand Master Yipshay. And he came over with uh, his, if I remember rightly, his daughter came, and she was sparring with and testing people, and I thought, oh, there's a lot to the system. And I didn't know too much about what was the style about, but um, I said I wanted to go ahead and learn this. So, sometime later, I decided to go to Hong Kong. Uh, the first time I was there for about uh, five, five months maybe and then uh, you come back and uh, work for a little while, save up my money and then go again I uh, kept on continuously doing that until I brought um, Grandmaster over in 1987 yeah about that time, 1987 and that was when I had my first time, first full time school because it's customary that when you open up a school you invite your teachers to, in the olden times, to bless the school, to give it to the, um, the uh, what's the word, the lineage. So that, that's, yeah, that was about 87. Grandmaster's uh, second floor, third floor flat, is it? So you're saying Grandmaster's? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, sleeping 
<laughs> the hard bit, if you know the hard. Uh, so, well, it's not there anymore, but um, it was great. It was it was um, wonderful times because it was new, it was fresh, and uh, naturally, uh, in those days, kung fu was still was a mysterious art, not like today, where you can just go on YouTube and you can see every art that you can possibly imagine. In those days, it was um, unheard of, you know. I used to rise up early in the morning. It was five times a week. Uh, weekends you had off, you know. Um, but um, in the early mornings, uh, me and Grandmaster would go through some things. You know, Qigong, a little bit of this, and maybe a form, techniques. And in the afternoons, we would go to another place called in Mongkok, which was run by MCK, Master MCK. He was just opposite um, the police station. I don't forget the name of the road. And we used to train there um, during that time. Uh, Grandmaster, me and Grandmaster used to go there together. And we trained with all the students. And then in the evening, uh, or in the after, late afternoon, I would train with other students that come to Grandmaster's place. And sometimes, like, uh, there might be half a dozen people coming. And then later, later on in the evening, when my Sifu used to finish his work, I used to train for myself. So it was about three, sometimes four times a day I was training. Uh, it was more of a case of learning how to do things and technical and being good at maneuvers, ma ma uh, uh, maneuvers and showing you the ins and outs of the system. Yeah, so how to use the system, you know, basically. Uh, everyone. I mean, from uh, Lee Tin Loi, Master Lee Tin Loi, trained with Han see, when he was younger, until he went to um, uh, what's it uh, to South America. Um, I was training with many people. Um, it was many. I forget many of their names, but uh, Dai Wai Lung and uh, many, many people. There was loads of people that I don't see anymore, basically, you know, but there was, there was lots of people in those days. And it was very sort of um, different in those days in the sense that, uh, you know, you was doing weapons, you were doing different types of jongs and that. Whereas today, it's more conditioning than that, but in those days it was a lot of jong training, weapons and things like that. I don't think the training's changed, but I think people emphasize on different things. So, I mean, I like to take a leaf from a lot of things, but um, uh, the training in those days, as I said, you know, there was a lot more going on with technical, and obviously doing the grinding arm, Taiso, Dojong, <clears throat> but today we emphasize a little bit more on just say conditioning, some schools just conditioning and Taiso only. In those days, there's a lot more variety going on. You know? Before he learned Zhao Ga Tong Long, uh, he learned from his father. Um, and his father done a little bit of some form of Siu Lam or Shaolin. And he learned that from his father. And in one day he met, went to the school, Lao Soi, in, in a place called Hong Hong, many years ago. This was back in when he was about 20. He started at 21. That's when he started Zhao Ga Tong Long. So he went to uh, Hong Kong there, and according to the story he told me, he could not believe how powerful Lao Tzu was. And one of the things he's done is he grabbed um, uh, Master Yip Xiao at the time and, and shocked him and pulled him and he hit his head on the wall. And he was like on the floor for a, a couple of, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and he didn't know where he was. Then he went back to his father and he said, this, <laughs> this battle that you've been teaching me is nothing like the system that he learned from, he's learning now from Master Lao Tsai. So that's how he started. Very hard, yes, according to him. It was very based on conditioning your body through Qigong. Um, there was a lot of um, techniques to show how, how the movements were used. 
how, how to use the techniques, how to, to experience the combat situations, but there was a lot of, um, you know, how all the Hong Kong, there was a lot of this, you know, that's what it's like. Back in, I don't know what year it was, but sometime in the early 80s, um, me and my Sifu was talking about what I should be doing to make myself better, stronger, faster. So this is no contradiction, uh, like um, against one way or the other, but this is how it happens. So the my Sifu said, just do Chai So, just do Doi Jong, just do San Bu Jin. And we was talking in Dagon and Dog, yeah, uh, Road in Hong Kong. <coughs> and um, so after a little discussion, and suddenly Grandmaster came out of his bedroom and walked over and said, what are you talking about in Chinese? So we, he mentioned what we was talking about. And then <laughs> Grandmaster just swore and walked off. <laughs> you know, he just said, deal. Deal, and he walked off. Ah, and then I looked at him, what's going on? You know, he swore. <laughs> then he came back. He said, not just Tai Su Doi Jong, Sambujin, also technique, how to maneuver. And at that point, it was a lesson that I really learned at that early stage. And that's when he started to teach me swimming dragons to the soft side, because it's not all hard. We like to be hard, but we have to be soft as well. And the art, the art of martial arts is softness. You're firm, but able to deal with something through ease. And he taught me a great lesson that day from, from the Swimming Dragons, Yaolong, uh, Sapa Yaolong. Uh, another story, <coughs> a long time ago, um, he was showing me some maneuvers. He said, you know why you do this? And I wasn't too sure at that time, but then he explained the technique and he said, this is what happened to me and this is where this technique also is useful. So uh, in Dagon, though, there's an underground pass that used to go to the old airport, yeah, um, the Taikat airport. And uh, he was coming back from there one day and uh, someone attacked him and grabbed him around the neck. And you know Grandmaster's got a very strong neck. He managed to pull his neck in and just turn like this. And this guy was like shocked. And he, but he grabbed Grandmaster in and Grandmaster done a technique. At the same time as he done it, he tore his, his jacket. And then he, Grandmaster came back to the house uh, upstairs and, he said, and his son said, oh, what's happened to you? Why are your clothes all ripped and things like that? He, describe the technique that he overcome it from from that particular incident so it was a practical application in a real life situation that he had to he had to do yeah well the, the first and foremost that um uh, he had many uh gongs you heard of gongs gong means to speak sal means hands in other words in hong kong in the early days if you open a martial arts school, nine times out of ten you will get challenged. Not, not so much now. People have schools up in there. But in Hong Kong in the 50s, in the 40s, 50s, you know, you had to prove yourself a little bit. So Grandmaster um, had a few fights, not always just fighting, but you know, test of techniques and things like that. Um, and he was famous for that. And one of his uh, most famous is taking up the challenge with another Kung Fu master which others were reluctant to, to do. So that made him famous. And then he had other, uh, other uh, conf confrontations with other styles from Pat Mei to Long Ying to Wing Chun. And so he got famous for this. That's just um, a, a myth that's come up just recently. Um, and I can say to this from an open heart, um, Grandmaster Yip Soi learned a lot of Lao Tzu, and when Lao Tzu was, uh, was um, very ill, prior to him dying in 42, 1942, Grandmaster looked after him for that time. And um, he did say to uh, Master Yip Shui, that when he gets better, he will teach him more. 
because there are other things. So it's not true that um, there's only four forms. From my knowledge, if it is true, there's only those four forms, then it's a little bit incomplete because those, those four forms that people are talking about, but no, Grandmaster taught me many things to say this is not, this, this cannot, uh, speaking honestly, there's more than that if you're just talking about them. Anyway, at the end of the day, forms are not just necessary, it's the application of the movements and what you're, how, you use, how to use them, how to, how to um, in combat. So that's more important as well. It's not just about forms. But the four forms that you struck we talk about are just, there's, there's three stages in Jao Ga Tong Long. One is that you learn about your uh, uh, position, yeah? So when you do use all the angles, the different types of um, uh, uh, positions you have, to, you have to do, this is achieved in the first, second and third. Later they become more technical and then later they start moving left and right. Say, say Mun Sao, he goes left, he goes right, he goes for four directions just as they. So there's, there is a, a method in which it's, you know, how it goes. But the first stage is getting your angles right. And that's why many of the basic forms, they're not used for fighting, but rather for developing, like Sambu Jin and Sambu Jin yourself, you know. I'm sure that um, he may have had his own technique, I think, but I don't think you create anything new. I think you just create different dimensions to what you know. It's not possible that you can create a new technique, but you can, you can sort of develop certain skills that are applicable in certain situations, but it's the same skill. It's why I'd like if I do, say, you kill like this, and I know that I shook off the bridge, shake off the bridge, then I might do something else after. This, so I'm not creating anything new, I'm just building up different ways of how to use it. So um, I've heard that, um, th that there are certain manoeuvres that are created by him through his own experience in martial arts that he's actually used or needed at the time. 87. Uh, 88? 87-88. Grandmaster just gave me. Yeah. I didn't ask. Yeah. Uh, the flag is there. The flag is still there. Um, you know what it is is that you have a. There's a Chinese character there. It's, it's a doll, and there's a cover on the top. There's a picture of, like the character of a doll. It means that you the you on you have the weapon. That, that's what it means. Um, Difficult to describe. It's like a, if you're the main man, you're called a Zheng Mun Yan. Zheng means uh, palm. Mun means gate. Yan means person. So in other words, the person who has the palm gate in his hand. That's what, um, that's what Zheng Mun Yan means. So when you are a representative, you also have something similar like a, a weapon and you have a covering over it. It means this score is the main score. Here's a cap with it. Uh, one, you know. So Wu Lam, martial arts, you know. That was a long time ago. That was about 87, 88, something like that. Yeah. I mean I was a little bit of a little bit of a tear away, you know. I heard about all the stories in Hong Kong and I thought, well let's be the same, you know. So um, in those days they were I call them dark days, you know. Because it's not necessary, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> It wasn't, you know. I think the best way, if you want to test yourself, you you got you got MMA now. You got you can do it that way now. But uh, there was a few times that I had to, yeah, not just act to, but also went to, you know. So I go out of my way just to do this and do that. But I don't think, uh, you know, I've learned that lesson, and I think it's not the nice one. But. Uh, I think the best way is um, to practice and develop your character and if you want, wish to fight or go in a competition, then that's okay, you know, do it competition way. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, you know, the first time, yeah, the first time I wondered why I didn't end the fight in, um, you know, in 20 seconds. <laughs> it went on for 11 minutes. Yeah, people watching at the time. So that went on for 11 minutes. 
Yeah, so that changed it. And I thought, why is that? <laughs> 11 minutes to have a fight. Continue, you know, obviously, you know when you're fighting for 11 minutes and you're hitting and you're punching each other, you know, you know what to... But the strangest thing is, I never got hit once on the face. I don't know, maybe something protecting me. <laughs> and then I looked to the other person, because it was in the dark as well. And, uh, like, in the evening, should say, you know, and, um, you yeah. So I was lucky, you know, could have got really badly damaged, you know, so could have lost an eye for what, you know, just for a little fight, you know, so what's the point? Yeah, I started, well, obviously I started sparring a lot more. Yeah, that's one thing that changed me. And then another time when I had another fight, <laughs> I'd done the, you know, the 24 principles about you chase someone, you relentlessly, and I've done that, and I don't know, I, ch I must have chased this person, and a length of, uh, maybe twice the length of this, and I got up the other end, and I was out of breath. <laughs> but I won, but I was out of breath, and I thought, I hope this bloke don't fight on anymore. And he didn't, he, oh, I give up, give up. And I was going, oh, and that turned away. That was terrible. But maybe it was that, just that particular day, you know, but it happened. You know, I was, I was punching. Oh. <laughs> um. Honestly, I don't think he has everything. Because, but he has something. Enough to get you out of something. But if you wish to go a little bit further, then maybe you need to, you know. But we don't know what the, the you know, if we went back, say to Joanne Arms time, um, we don't know what was missing, what was gone, we don't know. We can only assume that Grandmaster taught as much as he had and pass it on. So if he, if he skips 10% and then the next person skips 10% and the next person skips 10%, after 10 generations there's nothing of the original system left. So uh, it's important, you know, and in the right character, character for people being passed on, that's important as well. Ah, this is, this is a problem because not many people are teaching the other things. So say, there's a um, pool of light steps, one of the um, advanced forms. It's not a form actually, it's a, it's a concept. It's called the hall of light steps. And you go around in a circle. Um, because Grandmaster um, told me a story about how Bruce Lee, he was in a, a taxi talking to one of Grandmaster's students. And Bruce Lee said, you know, Yipsoi is a good Kung Fu fighter. He said, but the trouble is, is that Jau, uh, not Jao Ka Prince, but Southern Prime Manus only care to look forward. That's what Bruce Lee said. And then Grandmaster said, yes, this is only true if you only know this much. So that's why you have uh, people doing the Hall of Light Steps. I think maybe, maybe four or five people in Hong Kong. I asked Grandmaster many years, how come only four people know this that I know of? There might be more, like you're saying, but I know four. Uh, Leighton Boy. MCK, choice again, Hall of Light Steps, where you go around in a circle, because it's a concept. I'll try and explain later, yeah, what the concept is, yeah? And if that's the case, then we have to brush that aside. But it's not. There's the circle of steps. But there's a reason that you go linear first, because you have to get your, your, your angles right. Because it is about angles in the beginning. Like when you're doing grinding arm, you get your elbow in, when you do dojong, things like that. I train, for me, I train the way I feel I necessarily need to go. So, like for instance, people say, oh, you know, there's no, no need for grappling. There's no need for, you know, because you know the whole story, the old Kung Fu story, you put your arms up, no one's going to take me down because you know, my legs and my so strong. For me, that's short sightedness. There's a chance that you could be taken down, taken down to the floor anytime. 
So I always say, try to learn this as well. Try to learn. It's, you're not doing it any d in, injustice. Because I tell you another story, because as these stories, as, you're, as we're talking, yeah, stories are coming to my head about Grandmaster and about Lao Soi. Lao Soi had a student. And um, Grandmaster told me this story about how this student that um, Lao Soi had, had very strong legs. And he had strong kicks. Now, if we were short-sighted, we would say, well, no, forget your legs. You must do this and that. Don't use your legs anymore. But Lao Tzu didn't. He taught him the system, but he also taught him how to use his legs as well. So you don't neglect your natural hidden talent, do you? If you did, then that would be it'd be suicide in some sense. If you're good grappling, should I say, no, you shouldn't grapple because you only should do this? No, I disagree with that as well. So, um, Lao Tzu had a student, and he taught this student Pong Long Go. And because he learned all these maneuvers, he already had strong legs, and therefore he became a better martial artist. That's the story the Grandmaster told me. So that was what? Before the Second World War, when maybe I don't know when this was when he taught this uh, student, you know? but um, that's that's the story that uh, you know the grandmaster said. Um, so you don't you don't neglect your your hidden ability. So if I was a good grappler and you know I came in to do jail guard, I should keep that that utensil or that ability to and then learn the other as well. I think that's very important. I don't think we could ever, you know, people may say, ah, you know, but then you, you um, compensate. I don't think you compensate, you know. I, you, what's the word? Compromise? No, I don't, it's not about compromise. It's about enhancing all areas. Because there's only three areas in martial arts. There's striking and hitting, elbows, punches, knees, kicks. There's throwing, yeah, and there's grappling. And the grappling exists up, down, below. So you should know. Yeah? You know, so uh, you should know those three things. There's, other than that, there's weapons, which you might throw or you might hold. But in martial arts, there's three things. Punching and kicking, you know, striking, grabbing, and into front. It falls into that category. So regardless what martial art you do, you must have that category, then three categories.